Okay, good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen, and, and welcome to this um, webinar to run through the results for the second quarter of um, 2022 for Caledonia Mining. I'm, I'm Mark Leomont, Caledonia Mining CEO, and I'm joined today by uh, Dana Roots, Caledonia C Chief Operating Officer, and by Chester Goodburn, Caledonia CFO. And also in attendance, we have um, Camilla. Okay, so Camilla, can you just move on to move through the disclaimer um, just on to just so by way just a very brief summary uh, production was excellent um, not the, the gold price was a, a sort of a modest following following wind it wasn't a particularly beneficial um, but so so the real improvement in um, in revenue was driven by the higher production um, and then the improvement in gross profit and uh, profitability was a combination of higher production and excellent cost control but I think more, more information on that from operationally from Dana and uh, financially from Chester. So I think we'll just, just move on. Okay, I'll ask um, Dana if he could just give us some, some highlights for the uh, production for the, for the second quarter. Dana? Good afternoon. We had an exceptional quarter and for that matter, a record, record quarter. Um, we are building up to 80,000 ounces. We'll be in steady state next year. And uh, the higher production was due to increased tonnage malt and improved grades and recoveries. And central shaft is currently only wasting waste while we finishing the infrastructure around the shaft. Um, <clears throat> we, we basically equipped the one opos and then we're busy with the second, second opos. And we should start wasting reef by the end of the th third quarter uh, going forward, we, which will put us in good stead. Then, the shaft plus the, the infrastructure around the shaft will be fully operational. So currently we're only uh, hoisting ore at four shaft, uh, but it helped a lot that we could divert all the waste to the central shaft. And then <clears throat> at the end of the quarter, we had 12,700 tons of ore on a stockpile estimated to contain about 1,500 ounces of recoverable gold, which is not in the quarterly production total. We still uh, are confident that we will, um, with the guidance of 73,000 ounces to 80,000 ounces, and the July production was 6,535 ounces. Thank you, Mark. Don, I just, just want to um, give a little bit of background as to why July's production was, was, was a little bit disappointing. I think you should just talk about um, <coughs> BM, BM7. Yes, during during uh, July we, we lost one of our primary mills, um, ball mill seven. The end end uh, uh, um, shield of, of the mill broke. Unfortunately, we couldn't uh, repair it, and it had to be sent in to be recasted. It, it's made of cast iron, um, and that should be operational by the end of August again. So it did limit limit our um, milling, which uh, obviously then went through to um, to August. Um, and that stockpile of us just kept on growing. Um, good news is, is that um, we are busy hot commissioning the new regrind mill, um, ball mill 10. Um, and uh, so by the end of August, we will be fully operational with the ball mill 7 mill repair, repaired and the new regrind mill fully operational. And that, that will give us the capacity that we need um, for total um milling at, at at blanket and then we will start uh, eating into the stock post good thank you Dana. should we just move on <clears throat> okay i'll ask um, i'll ask chester to um to run through the uh the financial slides so chester over to you thank you mark and um, hello everybody those uh, on the back of those production numbers, um, we can see that coming through on our gross, gross profit. Um, that's up full time quarter by 29%. Uh, for our half year, it's up 44%. And uh, as Mark said, our production costs is in check. Um, our online costs is down by 2.9% quarter on quarter and down 10% on a half year basis. Administrative expenses, uh, that's that's up quarter on quarter, mostly due to advisory services fees incurred on the Bulbos transaction, which we'll come on to that in a, in a moment. Net foreign exchange gains amount to 5.1 million for the half year. 
And I think that number is uh, 9.7 million gain that's been realized. And that reduces our deferred tax expense and in effect uh, reduces our effective tax rate. Further, it gets deducted from our adjusted earnings per share. And there you can see in our quarterly number is down by 10%. And on a, on a half year basis, our adjusted earnings per share is up by, by 4%. We turn the slide. Production costs, wages, and salaries up for a quarter on quarter. That's uh, to remunerate our staff for the increase in production. And um, our consumables are up quarter on quarter due to inflation pressures experienced on explosives, drill steels, and cyanide. Inflation is not unique to Caledonia, we can see it in the global economy. Electricity is up, uh, is, is, is down, down, sorry, um, by $500,000 quarter on quarter. And that's due to capital initiatives that we've implemented by installing the auto tap uh, changes and our, our full sharp income, uh, reducing our utility bill and also reducing our, our use of diesel gensets. All our production costs remains in check. In the left, it's uh, turn the slide. Administrative costs, advisory services fees are up due to the conclusion of the, the Bulbo's agreement. Finding lawyers and various advisors. We'll see some more coming through in quarter three. Base relations is up, and travel is also up um, as we see an uptick in travel of our staff members post COVID 19 lockdowns. So, cost per ounce remains in check. All in sustained costs for the, the quarter end is, is up by, by 3% due to larger administrative costs, as explained. And for the half year, it's down by, by 2%. The breakdown of tax indicates a lower deferred tax charge. As a result of unrealized foreign exchange gains that uh, reduces our deferred tax liability and then reduces our taxation charge and also affect the tax rate. Uh, Zimbabwean legislation has remained fairly stable over the years, and so has the, the, the effective and well, the enacted uh, tax rates in Zimbabwe. Increase in production has also bolstered our net cash from operating utilities. That's increased quarter on quarter by 31%. On a half year basis, that's increased by 83%. Our cash generated, we've uh, invested back into blanket, we've invested back into the security of supply of electricity via our solar plant, and we've also repaid some loans. Further to that, we've returned about four and a half million dollars over the half year to our shareholders. Okay. If you look at our balance sheet, it uh, shows a uh, large investment in our total assets and largely the, the, in, the result of the, the, the reason for the increase in our total assets. Current liabilities remain fairly stable. And um, as of 30 June, Mostly consists of what we owe the taxman and and freight creditors. As you can see, our balance sheet is is got a very low year ratio. Cash at quarter end amounted to ten point nine million. Eight point nine million of that uh, was in Zimbabwe. Our post quarter end, we we dividend out uh, four million dollars to the UK and to Jersey. And we've uh, converted a letter of credit to pay our South African oil for goods purchased at, at the blank mine of 2.25 million. That was exchanged uh, to South African rands and is now situated in South Africa. Caledonia continues to remit sufficient cash from Zimbabwe and we are not accumulating unusable or unremitable RTGS. Mark, should we turn over to you to Volvo's? Yeah, uh, these these slides these slides um, or the following slides re repeat the the slides that we presented several weeks ago. 
when we um, brief shareholders on the on the bilbo transaction so i'll go through that i'll go through them quite quickly just as a refresher but basically bilbo is it's a, it's a large scale low cost long life uh, gold project um, located some way north of um, Bulawayo, uh, blanket mine is um, some way south of Bulawayo. So there's no there's no scope for um, significant sort of synergies. They're not close enough to run on a combined basis. So we've signed a um, a sale and purchase agreement to purchase this asset for a consideration of five just over five million shares and a one percent um, net smelter royalty, uh, which equates to about twenty eight and a half percent of our fully diluted um, equity. Bilbo's um, has a, um, a large resource base. It's got reserves of just under 2 million ounces at uh, 2.3 grams a tonne. Uh, measured an indicated uh, resource of two point, over 2.5 million and an additional um, inferred resource of over half a million. And it's fair to say as well that there is, um, there is also significant exploration potential remaining on the property. The existing owners, um, have a feasibility study which we which we published, um, which caters for a, a very large open pit uh, operation producing about 168,000 ounces, an average of 168,000 ounces of gold a year. I think it peaks at just under 200,000 um, ounces a year. And it's uh, given the, given the fact it's a um, it's large and it's um, it's got a good grade. It's got a, a, a very attractive internal rate of return of uh, 33% at an all entertaining cost of um, $826 an ounce. Now, the capex to build to build that project in a single leap in the feasibility study is about $250 million. Now, that will probably have gone up actually in the current environment. Uh, I want to be very clear that um, that we are approach to commercializing this property. Will will take into account the um, the cost of raising the funding for the property, uh, and, and funding will come from three sources. Um, first, debt uh, to the extent that's available on on, on attractive terms. Uh, secondly, from internal cash flows, um, that's that's from Bilbo's, uh, that's that's from Blanket, and also from the tribute arrangement, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And thirdly, from equity. And be absolutely clear, we're not we're not throwing ourselves into the tender mercy of the markets to raise equity and knock down, knock down prices. So frankly, if the equity price do, isn't conducive, we'll simply fall back onto a, a smaller scale first phase project where we will, we, we will fund from internal cash plus, plus debt and then do the sec, fund the second phase from <clears throat> the cash flows coming from the first phase. And that's exactly, that's exactly the approach that we took on the uh, Central Shaft project, which as you recall, we built completely Using um, using our own um, internal resources, but it's somewhat unusual. Unusual, I guess, for a non-Zimbabwean transaction <clears throat> is this tribute arrangement. So even even before we complete the deal, and, and completion won't be until later this year at the earliest. Um, even before completion, we will commence. We'll invest money in Caledonia. Will will manage and and, and restart a, a relatively small uh, oxide operation which should be capable of starting, starting producing within a few months and then will become cash, uh, cash neutral. So we'd recover our initial, initial cost of, of restarting the operation within about six months. And then thereafter, we'd expect it to generate a, um, a modest um, cash flow of between one and $2 million a month uh, for a period of about 30, 30 months. So that cumulatively um, is quite a nice accretion to our, um, to our cash generation. Should we move on? <clears throat> um, the, current, the current shareholders in uh, Bilbo's is a, a, a company called Tosiana, which is a vehicle controlled by uh, Mr. Kapari, Victor Kapari, who's a prominent um, Zimbabwean uh, mining entrepreneur and was previously a, a president of the Zimbabwe Chamber of Mines. And I, I sat with him on the um, on the executive committee of the Chamber of Mines for, for several years. Prior to that, he was a um, uh, an executive at an Anglo American Corporation in Zimbabwe. Uh, so he's got half of the asset. Uh, Baker Steel Resources Trust. Those of you in the UK will um, <clears throat> not need any any explanation as to who they are. They're a London listed investment trust uh, managed by Baker Steel Capital. They've got twenty four percent, and the balance is held by a Chinese investor group called Infinite Treasure. Sorry, excuse me. All you see on this page is the um, is extracted from the feasibility study, the estimated uh, monthly production. You can see it's sort of it's about 168,000 ounces a year, 
uh, that have pe peaks in sort of 2029 at, at nearly 200,000 ounces. And on the right hand side, you see the amalgamation of um, blanket production plus um, bilbo's production. Frankly, that's not particularly useful um, because you know, under, under Canadian regulations, we can only show um, production from measured and indicated. We can't amalgamate that production with, 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 with expected production from inferred. Um, and so that's why, frankly, once you get beyond 2026, um, under Canadian regulations, blanket begins to look quite anemic, even though in practical for practical practical purposes, we expect to continue producing at 80,000 ounces um, for the next 10 or 12 years. Let's move on. This is the production cost. Um, C1 cost is the light, light blue. Ornate sustaining cost is the dark blue. Uh, the ornate sustaining cost um, moves around, largely driven by the, uh, the amount of, um, of stripping that needs to take place, but it's a very competitive, a very competitive um, cost, cost profile. Let's move on. This just shows how the um, how the the shareholder base changes. So um, post transact post the transaction, the existing shareholders will existing Caledonia shareholders will hold uh, seventy one and a half percent of Caledonia, and the um, the the Bilbo's vendors um, will hold as, sh as shown in the little cutaway. So you end up with Tosiana holding thirteen and a half percent, Baker Steel will hold four and a half percent, and Infinite Treasure will hold um, about ten point six percent. There are several conditions precedent to the, tra to the transaction. Two, two really very important. One of them, one of them is that we will um, insist that we get the the right to export the gold produced from Bilbo's directly. Um, so we will not sell to Fidelity, which is the government-owned refiner. We'll sell under our own auspices to um, an offshore. A non-Zimbabwean um, precious metals refiner, and an LBMA, LBMA accredited, so probably Rand refineries, and so Rand refineries will pay us directly, and we will hold 100% of the sale proceeds in, in US dollars, uh, with no requirement to convert uh, the US dollars into a local currency. Now that that condition precedent um, cuts straight through um, one of the, the the biggest concerns that investors and certainly lenders have about operating on a gold mine in Zimbabwe, which is the current requirement to sell gold to Fidelity. And then a second, a second sort of very important commercial um, condition precedent is getting more clarification on the electricity supply to the project. Although having said that, the, <clears throat> the changes in the electricity supply sort of landscape in Zimbabwe are moving, it's moving very quickly at the moment. And actually I've got to say in a very positive direction. And it would appear that the, the government is, is, is now moving to liberalize access um, to independent power producers for um, larger larger users such as Caledonia, Blanket, and Bilbo's, and that means that, that means that we can get direct direct access to power produced in the region, which is mainly hydropower from either Mozambique or Zambia, and then the Zimbabwean authorities will will wheel that power through the grid uh, to the project, and it, it's it's um, whereas Blanket in particular suffers because it's at the end of a somewhat badly maintained um, um, line, uh, Bilbo's is, is much, much more fortunately located in that it's, it's got close access to a much better maintained, lower utilized um, line. So that actually augurs quite well for, um, for, um, for, for the Bilbo's project. And then, then several just sort of more technical sort of technical CPs, which I won't trouble you with at this stage. Should we move on? This just gives some context for the for the for the asset, the Bilbo's asset. So what you see here is um, is some of the other African uh, development gold gold development projects, and you can see looking at recovered grade, uh, Bilbo's is is far ahead of the rest. Uh, its recovered grade is just below two grams a ton, uh, and actually I think it's worth noting that the the average the average grade for most open pit um, operate or gold operations is now less than one gram a ton. So a two gram a ton recovered. Um, grade is is outstandingly good. Should we move on? This shows the size. Yes, there are one or two assets that are bigger, but Bilbo's is certainly up there in terms of size, uh, with uh, two million two million ounces of mineable mineable gold, with um, further exploration potential. Then finally, finally we um, we've we've paid a good price for it. Um, we paid I think about twenty seven dollars per um, per uh, M and I ounce. Which is very competitive. Uh, we're very pleased with that. So all of those three things together, the the size, the grade, and the fact that we bought it for a competitive price, um, bodes well uh, for the future. 
tribute arrangement, I think I've already, already mentioned. Um, so Bilbo's already has an on-site oxide um, operation, which has been running for several years, but because of their sale process, the Bilbo sale process took several years longer than they'd expected it to, it, several years longer than they had expected, it means that they have now exhausted their readily accessible um, oxide material. And so now they need capital to um, do a pre-strip to get down to, to, to uncover the material that's down to a depth of about 40 meters. So we, we will, we've entered into a tribute, we will fund the restart of that oxide project and we will be responsible for the implementation of the project and for all things related to the finances of the project and we'll collect the cash. Um, so the initial, the initial capital cost and, and sort of startup costs are estimated at about $5 million cumulatively, that's the cumulative max after about sort of 10 to 12 weeks. Then thereafter it becomes cash generative um, quite quickly um, so within about, within, about six, within about six months, and it should continue for about 30 months, the whole project. So let's move on. Um, this just shows you the dividend. We, 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 we stopped increasing the dividend earlier on this year, recognizing that um, it's quite likely that we would engage in transactions, which would mean that we have a, um, <clears throat> a, a future funding requirement. That's not to say the dividend will never go up again in future. Um, we have every intention of continuing to increase the dividend. It just, just seems that whilst we have a currently unquantified um, sort of funding need, it is prudent to, to, for the time being, keep the dividend at um, 14 cents per share per quarter. But the whole rationale for entering into transactions such as Bilbo's and also Marley Green is so that in due course, we can substantially increase the, uh, the dividend per share. So as a, as a shareholder myself, I've got a good idea as to what I believe I could expect today from, from Blanket Mine. And it's important to me that having, once we've you know, acquired Bilbo's, we've brought Bilbo's into production, we've also done Marley Green, I want to be conf confident that I can expect a substantially increased dividend higher than I would get if we just, just stayed at, uh, with, with, with Blanket. And that's the whole approach to this, this exercise. <clears throat> Let's move on. So that's, that's the end of the formal part of the presentation. So can I, can I suggest that Camilla opens the, um, opens the lines and we'll, um, we'll deal with questions. If any, of you are, if any of you are shy and you don't want to speak, you can uh, type, type a, a question. But I, I, say, I find those quite hard to deal with because without context, uh, sometimes it, it can mean that you, you perhaps may not get the, the answer to the question if, if I don't have sufficient context. So I, I've got to say, I prefer, I prefer it if people um, actually gave us a question. So Camilla? There aren't any questions at the moment. No questions. Okay, well, let's. Uh, uh, there is one. There is one. Yeah. Uh, well done. I thought we've got. A, I thought we've got an early afternoon off. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Uh, well, can you just run through your capex? Has gone up a little bit. Is that yeah. is that it? Is that the end of the capex going up? Or? No, no capex. We we had um, we had we figured in previous quarters that capex was going to go up. Um, and that's a combination of uh, the slightly increased cost. I mean, I can, I, I'll give you my thoughts and if Donna, you want to chip in and add, add more or, or Chester chip in and add more. It's a combination of uh, more expensive development work um, related to central shaft. Uh, we're spending quite a lot of money uh, remediating the electricity supply. Uh, so we had to replace uh, some generators that blew up because they've been overused. Uh, we, we're spending more money on auto tap changes. Um, which will, which is, which actually we we did some auto tap changes at the end of um, at the end of last year, and that that paid for itself remarkably quickly because it uh, it reduced our diesel consumption. So we're now replicating that that exercise um, at the at the electrical equipment round um, round uh, central shaft. Dana, Dana Chester, do you want to add any any more to to the capex discussion? Um, Mark, if I could just add that um, during COVID, um, just to give everybody back, we. Um, we, we, we had half a crew finishing the shop, equipping it uh, <clears throat> for six months. And then we, you know, we also had delays with the electricity um, and we, we finished equipping the shop, but the development uh, going out was delayed because of that. And what it meant was that more expensive, Mark spoke about more expensive, we were coming down with declines that to maintain the profile, the production profile, not running out of areas to, to mine, but it meant that we had to push those declines down a bit further. 
And that, that is done with tractors equipment. Um, and, and that development cost is, uh, it was extra and it was uh, higher. And <clears throat> then at, a, at, a, at the same time, um, the electricity cost was because, um, you know, as Mark said, we had to run the, the generators more because we had more dirty power and more um, um, load shedding at, at, at blanket. Um, so that was all extra. And then we had to um, push up the tons um, for, for this year. We had to push it up by um, um, 20%. And, and that is why we had to install the extra ball mill because the grade dropped slightly with the latest information available. So well, a combination yeah, of that. Well, having said that, our grade, we, the grade was actually, has been better than we'd expected, but never mind. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, because of that, we increased our milling capacity, which, which also put us in good stead for, for the future. So um, a couple of things that uh, that saw our capex go up a bit uh, this year. Can I just explain, yes, yeah. on, on electricity, can I just explain something? The, the auto tap changes that we put in place late last year protected the electrical, electrical equipment around number four shaft and um, and the, the metallurgical plant, okay? And so the reduction in diesel consumption has flowed through into operating costs. And that's why, one of the reasons why the online cost per ounce fell by 3% or so. The, the electrical equipment around central shaft is not currently protected by auto tap changes. And so that's where we are continuing to have to run the diesel generators. And that's why that contributed to the um, to the higher capital cost because the the diesel usage at central shaft is uh, is capitalised. I just thought I'd better make that point. Sorry, Chester, you're going to say yes. To, to add to the blanket expenditure, we also spent a large amount on solar. Um, our solar reached uh, mechanical completion by the, the, the end of, of, of June, and um, a large portion of that was bought from Q2. Certainly, we do. We we are look. It's fair to say that we we will have some catch up capital expenditure. Um, I mean, you will you you were at the mine recently, um, and you can see you can see with your own eyes there is there is a need to upgrade some of those um, office facilities and what have you. But um, you know that's that is by no means sort of structural structural stuff. So we are we are getting through the worst of the uh, the capex burden, and I do expect over time it will it will fall away. And then, yeah, that, that will make sense. And then just on the on the milling, what's your capacity going to be when everything's fixed and back up and running? Have we lost Donna? No, Donna's chipping in. I think, I think we just lost Donna. Uh, here he is. So Donna, yeah. did, Donna, did you get that question about milling capacity? Yeah, um, we yeah. will be able to do about... Uh, <laughs> yeah, our milling capacity will go up to 2,400 tonnes a day. We currently be doing uh, about 2,000 tonnes a day. Once everything is up and running. Okay. <clears throat> does that help? Will, does that answer your question? Yeah, just, just on the catch up, that's all. No, that's fine. That's good. Yeah. Okay. That's excess. You're going to have excess capacity anyway, then. So your catch up will flow in. That vast, that, that stockpile, which continues to grow, should hopefully start shrinking. Yeah. And then on the, just on the solar, um, do you expect any more payments? Or was it up to them to fix it? Yeah, um, there's there's quite a lot of activity relating to solar at the moment um, between us and the co current contractor and uh, ZETDC. Um, uh, and if you don't mind, I'd, I'd rather not unpack that at this stage. Um, but you, you've been there, you've seen you've seen the plant. It's there. It's ready to get plugged in. So we're, um, we're, we're working as hard as we can to try and get that sort of final commissioning fixed so that we can start, um, that we can start using the electricity from, the, from that uh, solar project in the, in the plant. Um, so it comes down to the, the commissioning. Okay, cool. That's it for me, thanks. Thank you, Will. Uh, we've got another question here from, from Barry. So there's a question. Oh, sorry, yes, is this a verbal question? Okay, go on. Yeah. Okay. Th thanks, uh, thanks, Mark. Um, my first question relates to the, uh, you know, growth, the growth through acquisitions uh, that the company is currently going through. Uh, maybe if you can share with us uh, after Bubos and probably the, uh, Mali Green, 
uh, is the company looking at acquiring more assets? Uh, mm -hmm. And um, is it still in Zimbabwe or in other areas? Um, we, 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 there are other assets that we would like to add to the portfolio. They are by no means as, as pressing as Bilbo's is ready. Bilbo's is ready to go. Okay. Um, Marley Green's a little bit, little bit further down the track. Um, any other asset that we would look at uh, would be even be, would become behind uh, Marley Green in that, in that it would have um, this much more exploration focus. So the answer is yes. Um, yes. Uh, and it would be in Zimbabwe. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much, Mark. I think that's uh, that's all from me. Okay. So I can see I can see two 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 written questions here. So but there's also Howard Finkel wants to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let's just deal with these two written. So can you briefly speak to any current or future exploration projects to understand some? Yes. So so we do we we do recognise at, at at Blanket in particular, we we do believe there is. Um, great exploration potential at depth. So that's following the existing ore bodies deeper in the shallower areas of the mine. And by shallow, I mean above 750 meters uh, in the, those areas between the existing, uh, the ore bodies that have, we've know, known about and have, have, been, um, have been depleting. Also, we believe there is um, mineralization to the immediate north and south of the current mine area. Um, and then further, we think there is um, we want to explore something called the banded ironstone formation, um, which lies about 800 meters to the east of the current um, mining area. So there is plenty of exploration potential. The, um, the impediment to us having made, making, making substantive progress on that, uh, part of the, the, the extension of the exploration at depth, we need uh, to um, improve our um, the access that we need to drill out some, some excavate some, some um, exploration cubbies and that, that's, in, that's in process now and should should allow uh, that exploration to start towards the end of this year. And then um, the further exploration, we, we need to um, invest in um, HR, human resources and um, technology to improve our exploration capacity. Donna, do you want to add anything to what I've said? So Mark, maybe just on the, you know, uh, first of all, we, we are looking at adding people to just to help us with uh, especially looking at the uh, opportunities, especially from surface in the bus, how we're going to tackle it. And um, you know, then, then the, the other extra people um, that we need to simple as you add more drilling, you add more people to operate it. So, um, but we wanna make sure that we, we start drilling in the right places um, and do not waste money and that's why with putting the models together, we, we need extra skills to do that. <clears throat> it, it's, fair to, it's fair to say that exploration, so the, for the past seven years or so, we've been focused pretty much exclusively on digging this 4,000 foot deep hole, uh, filling it full of steel, and then doing the horizontal development. We've now got the flexibility and the capacity to, to begin to take exploration much more seriously, and we are taking it more seriously. It's becoming a, a much higher priority in our um, in our daily lives, it's fair to say. Sorry, um, there's an, a question from somebody in Austria. Um, Resupplies from South Africa, how many months supplies on hand in case of South Africa lockdowns at the border? Uh, how would how would Bulawayo, lo, uh, lager supplies, you mean supplies of beer? Um, we, 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 don't have, we don't have supplies of beer at the moment. So Chester, are you wanting to answer that question? <laughs> Yes, um, our inventory levels are now at uh, what quarter, quarter two in with about 20.2 million. That's down from by about 1.3 million we drive to lower our inventories at blanket. Uh, to ask the question on, on you know, how um, much inventories we've got on hand, we've got to look at our inventory and break it down. Critical items, that's about five to seven weeks. And then we've got spares, spares that remain there for, for, for quite, quite a long time, uh, just for in the event that something breaks out. So critical, you know, if you look at any bows downs in South Africa or so, we can survive for about seven weeks um, without any supplies at, at Blanket. Look, it's fair, to, it's fair to say that what happened over the past few years is that um, the, the, that mantra, you know, just in just in time became just in case, and it, I think it was the case that that in certain certain sort of line items, the mine was carrying 
too much stock, uh, which meant that our working capital was going up. And so we have, we have done a bit of an exercise to try to redress that balance. But having said that, you know, we, we, don't, we don't run the mine at such a, a sort of a, a, on a bare bones basis, such that if there is any interruption um, in, in difficulty at the border, the mine runs out of stuff. So it's, it's, it's a balancing act. And honestly, I think it had gone too far in terms of overstocking. Um, so we, we've taken corrective action. And just to add that a lot of those critical supplies we can get in country. It just depends on, on what price we get it at. And we can get it all across the globe. So we're not reliant on, on one country to supply us. But how much, what's, what's being locally supplied? I mean, as far as, far as I know, um, Don, are you, able, are you able to say what's supplied locally and what, what, we, what, we, what we procure in South Africa? Mark, um, if, if you look at it basically, CapEx, we're very much dependent on, um, on, on South Africa and, and the rest of the world for that matter. Uh, but explosives, um, some of it we, we get locally and some of it's South Africa. And then the, the steel balls for the for mill, for example, that's locally. So um, if you look at more the day-to-day -day running stuff, it's, it's more locally. Um, so, okay. Yeah. Uh, and that also changes over time. We, we compare prices on what we can get globally outside of Zimbabwe and what we can get in country. And uh, we try and get the right quality and the right price uh, for our mine. Yeah. Okay, Howard, can we um Howard, can we can we open the line for you? You got to... oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, is the difference between reported earnings and adjusted earnings? The taxes related to depreciation? Oh, that's a fantastic question. I'm so pleased that Chester can answer that question. <laughs> this, I've got to say, this, Howard, this, this quarter was particularly, it, it becomes, some quarters it becomes very hard to explain. And it's large, yeah. large, largely, dri largely driven by the effect of uh, foreign exchange gains and losses on the deferred tax calculation. And I'm delighted that Chester can talk to you about that. Just <laughs> to keep us on for 10 minutes, eh? I'll be more very smart. EPS, um, that takes into account NCI and non-cash items. For, for just EPS, we take out uh, non-cash items such as that large unrealized foreign exchange uh, gain that we had of, of about 9.7 million. That reduced our adjusted earnings per share. We also take out deferred tax. It's a, it's a non-cash item. Uh, it's a lot smaller this, this quarter, so that uh, the smaller effect um, as you see in, in our presentation there, uh, the quarterly adjustments is a lot lower than the comparable one, mostly due to that the foreign exchange devaluation that's it's non-cash. No, I mean, okay. No, I mean, how it, how it, yeah. yeah. Gen, gen, genuinely, some, some years ago, we, we started doing an adjusted earnings per share because we, we, we just we, there was often so much background noise in the IFRS results. I mean, things like massive foreign exchange gains. Um, sometimes we get we get big sort of funny um, income items coming from um, export incentive schemes. So it was a genuine attempt to try and make it more um, more sort of user friendly for users. But unfortunately, uh, it, often it, it then means that we create another problem for ourselves in that we end up with the the uh, the effect of the foreign exchange gains then then flowing through and, and fiddling around with deferred tax. So we're kind of chasing our tails. So, you know, half of me would say, just leave it to I, just leave it to IFRS and let people work it out for themselves. But often some, there are some huge numbers floating around the place and we sort of, we feel, we sort of feel as though we, we should try and um, interpret it for uh, shareholders. But sometimes it, sometimes it feels like it's more trouble than it's worth actually. Second, um, is your solar plant not yet operational? I thought it would be operational around now. It's not been commissioned. That's the problem. Chester, do you want to explain exactly what's happening? Yes, uh, we need to connect to the blank mine grid. For us to, commit, to, to connect to the blank mine grid, we need to get uh, cooperation from the ZTDC. And, uh, just explain also who they are, Chester. Just explain who they are. ZTDC is the utility of Zimbabwe. Um, and they need to approve any any connection to any grid, um, 33 KV and above. Now, um, we also need to, to get um, our EPC contractor to do the necessary tests and finalize the, the commission work on the solar plants. But uh, the solar plants being 
mechanically complete for, for several weeks, uh, barring the energy management system. So really, so really, so really, what it comes down to is a is a failure to communicate between the EPC contractor and ZETDC, and it's it's fair to say that ZETDC are now um, um, cooperating fully, um, because as I said previously, there, there's there's quite a lot of um, there's quite a lot of action stuff happening uh, in that in that particular area, and I'd, and I'd rather not sort of dwell on that too much at this stage. Oh, so, but, but, it's, but it's on route. It's, it's, it's in process. It's on route. It's, it's there. It's, the only the only thing is there. I mean, um, uh, and Will, who asked a question earlier, was was saw the thing saw the thing a, a, a month or so ago. Uh, it's there, and it's it's frustrating that um, you know all it takes is a, is a is a few a few bits of testing to actually get the thing commissioned and um, and operational. But I think what the, what I would leave you with is the fact that we do have contractual protections in place to recompense us in the event of delays such as this. That's all I can okay. say. My final question before a comment is, could you, Mark, could you develop both Mally Green and Bill Bowes, I think is the pronunciation, at the same time, both managerially and financially? I'd say yes, but Donna, Donna would say no. Donna, Donna doesn't want to do, now I think, I think, um, I think financially, it, look, it, it might be a bit of a stretch financially, but I think I think more realistically, um, trying to do two projects at once in Zimbabwe, I think maybe maybe too much of a challenge. I mean, Donna, do you want to do you want to give some more context on that? Yeah, um, if you want to build two two projects at the same time, experience past experience with that, you know, it becomes a headache. And uh, ideally, our model will be that. You know, you build one while you get the other one uh, shovel already, do the fe feasibility study and everything. So once once the, the project um, it starts paying for itself, then you, you start building a new one. But, it's, um, but how, how it's also fair to say that, that Marley Green may benefit from, obviously it needs a feasibility study, but Marley Green may well benefit from, um, from further incubation to see if we can actually find a bigger resource base. Dan, uh, Dan uh, be careful about that phrase, Shovel ready. We learned an experience here about what shovel ready really means and what they're shoveling. <laughs> okay, all right. Let, let, let me rephrase it. Uh, yeah, when you're right. ready to build it, feasibility <laughs> study yeah. and, and, and the finances required. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to add, Mark, mm. that for five million plus fifty-five million in six uh, for um, Bilbo's in six months or so. You'll be generating cash, say a million and a half between a million and a two. Yep. Uh, uh, so per year, that's a thirty percent return per year as long as it lasts. Yep. That's all, that's during startup. Yep. That makes the deal even more attractive. That's pretty fancy. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, um, absolutely. Let's hope it lasts for four or five years. Well, we only need it. Well, we don't have a feasibility study for the oxide, so we can't. We can't re. We can't really talk about it in more detail, but um, the, we, when we evaluated the project and when we, you know, when we agreed the deal, we we had no, we had no, we had attributed no value to these oxides. It wasn't included. It wasn't included in the data room. So you're quite right. It, this is like a bit of a windfall. No, oh, I, I would, and I'll add something else that I just remembered. Um, the attitude of Menangagwe, if that's the correct pronunciation. Yep towards independent power producers is a really absolutely really useful uh, description of commercial changes undergoing under Zimbabwe which people think still think I agree is with pretty, pretty risky I would say there are some parts of uh, of Australia or Canada and certainly Mexico that are riskier that's a very very positive development no it is, it is and frankly it, it gets to the point where you know, when a country like Zimbabwe is is faced with the difficulties it faces, they've just got to take the ob got to come up with the obvious solution, which is the government must step away and allow those companies like us that have got the the money to do the necessary. Um, and it's, it's 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 really refreshing. We saw something similar. Yes. We saw something similar happen actually relating to electricity as well. Um, about 10 years ago when there was a similar sort of crisis and uh, government moved very quickly to um, to fix a problem because um, don't forget don't forget I mean um, 
I don't need to remind South Africans of this, that, um, that you know, people don't like it when they're sitting at home in the dark for 12 hours a day. Isn't that correct, Dana? Uh, and that phrase, government stepping away, is very rare. It's very rare that a politician relinquishes that kind of control. And uh, it's surprisingly encouraging. Yes, but that's... that's it is, it is, it is yeah, overall really nice nice work guys uh one day people will figure out that five percent yield is attractive good okay any more questions thanks thank you Howard. you're welcome hold on tony are we looking for alternative logistical chains uh access from mozambique for instance i think we do we the solar panels did come in from mozambique didn't they that's that right, Tom. Yeah, yeah it's down through the border, border, beta border post. And um, we've also identified other supply lines from Walfus Bay. Coming through Namibia. So that's, okay. so that's coming through that's coming through Namibia. We are we are um we do recognize the the inherent risk of relying on <clears throat> South Africa as a as a as a sort of source of product and as a as a as a sort of shipping conduit. We do recognize that. And so we we are we have the beginning to develop alternatives. Right, is there, um, is there any more, uh, no one more question? Would you consider share? No, uh, offering shares in lieu of dividends. We um, we looked at that, and it's called it's called a drip, isn't it? A dividend reinvestment program, I think, and that caused some that caused some tax issues for um, for some shareholder bases. So um, I think we we just prefer to do to do cash. Um, I think at this stage. Um, so Dawn of the Mine is basically like the Goldfields video. So how many vehicles are underground? How many vehicles are underground on the three levels? These vehicles, when I think of these vehicles, I think of something like a, um, a Bentley Mulsanne um, underground. They cost about the same as a Bentley Mulsanne, don't they? And the tires are twice as expensive. So Dawn, what's the, talk about the fleet, um, talk about the underground fleet. Mark, we've got, we've got LSDs and we've got dump trucks um, that uh, we use. And of those, uh, we've got about 12 LSDs and 11 dump trucks. <clears throat> okay. Then, then it goes on to say, how long or how deep do you drill? So what's the, what's the, daily, what's the daily, daily drilling for, um, for production? I think it's three meters, isn't it? It depends. In our uh, uh, long, long hole stokes, we drill uh, about 12 meter holes. Your, your sub levels are 15 meters apart. And you draw from level to level, and, and obviously it's about two meters high. That's why it's not a full fifty meters you draw. And then if if you look at our uh, uh, hand tilt um, and under hand uh, stopping, where they we draw two meter rounds. Yeah, and um, we have one blast a day, which is normally about now, isn't it? About tea time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Good. Are we are we done for? Any any more typed questions or any any more um, anybody want to ask a question? Okay, I think we I think we're done then. Okay, well thank you thank you for joining and um, obviously we'll update you with um, with further news as as appropriate. But um, thank you very much.